joining us tonight. I want to thank everyone for joining us for this session of Imagine 2022 entitled Developing an Entrepreneurial Culture in the Workplace. My name is Caroline Mooney and I'm a second semester senior finishing up my BFA in graphic design and minor illustration. I'm currently interning for Imagine 2022 in career services as their promotions intern on campus. I'm involved with our admissions department as a student tour guide and a student intern for the Admissions Promise program. I'm also the president of the Osmigo Design Club and the social media coordinator for Cut the Craft. After graduation, I plan to work as a graphic designer for an agency while also working on my own small business, CM Creatives Co. So thank you again for joining us tonight for a session on developing entrepreneurial culture in the workplace. We are well into our second annual Imagine 22 program sponsored by the President's Office, Career Services, and the Alumni Association. This is the second week of an amazing program series focused on giving current students and the class of 2021 the chance to explore career paths, find job and internship opportunities, network with alumni and more. Check out the website for more details and the link will be in the chat. Just by attending tonight's event, you'll be eligible for a prize drawing at the end of the week. Last week, we gave away some Oswego hoodies. If you complete our survey at the end of the session, we will enter you twice. One housekeeping item, please place any questions or comments into the chat as we'll be closely monitoring them throughout the entire session. And now I am so excited to introduce you to our panel of alumni. Joe Kinsella graduated from SUNY Oswego in 1991 with a degree in computer science. He is an entrepreneur, investor, and technology leader from Boston. Joe founded Cloud Health Technologies in 2012 with the goal of disrupting the growing complexity of cloud computing. Under his leadership, Cloud Health grew into a global cloud management leader. And in October 2018, he sold the company to VMware. He is passionate about Boston startups, baseball, and all things cloud, not necessarily in that order. Joe was previously VP of engineering at the Amazon backed cloud archiving company, Sonianus, managing director at Dell, where he led global engineering teams, and VP of engineering at Silver Black Technologies, where he helped pioneer remote IT management software. He has the unusual distinction of having been a member of, quote, the first scum team as a founding member of the Eagle Synchronous City team before the advent of the Agile Manifesto. He's an avid blogger and advisor for the University of Massachusetts Boston Entrepreneur Center and a member of the Forbes Technology Council and a Boston CIO of the Year Award winner. Indy Lee graduated from Sunyas Oswego in 1993 with a BS in accounting. Indy met her now husband as a student at Sunyas Oswego while living in Seneca Hall and the two celebrated their 26th anniversary in December. In 2008, Indy was diagnosed with a life-threatening tumor that doctors felt could be environmentally derived and attributed to something as simple as what she was putting on her skin. This was her awakening. After surviving a successful surgery, she embarked upon a new journey in daily skin care, a clean beauty line dedicated to educating and empowering others to live their healthiest lives. Bill Testa is a 1987 SUNY Oswego graduate who earned a bachelor's degree in technology education with concentrations in printing and business. He currently drives all aspects of Friends, including partnerships and global expansion. He is also the president of Direct Mail 2020, the parent company of Flag staff product difference, as well as the president and CEO of the Testa Group, an umbrella company for a number of business ventures. As a printing and marketing entrepreneur for more than 30 years, his ideas and achievements constantly place him at the cutting edge of industry practice, with a respected reputation as an effective leader with a lead by example worth ethic. Testa serves as the president of the Greece Rotary Club, Greece Buccaneers SC, and on the board of directors for the YMCA of Greater Rochester, Greece Chamber of Commerce. The People's CPA, Chanae Wilson, MS and MBA, is a serial social entrepreneur, investor, and wealth educator. She's a founder and CEO of Fola Financial LLC, a financial service firm dedicated to empowering others through the use of financial education and economic enrichment. The Tax Essential Learning Program, also known as TELP, is an IRS certified tax education program and is the co-founder of the private FinTech company. As a CPA for the people, she prides herself in educating and providing exceptional financial services to creative entrepreneurs, small business owners, investors, and affluent professionals, all while training and developing the next generation of elite accounting advisors and tax professionals. 
She has been featured as a tax expert in the New York Times, Forbes, PIX11, CNBC Squawk Box, and currently serves as the Business Insider's Tax Review Board. To her quote, education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. A warm welcome to all of our guests tonight. I'd like to start with some questions and we'll begin with a general question for everyone. And I'm gonna start with you, Joe. So please restate your name, your current position, and tell us a little bit about your entrepreneurship journey. Sure, so uh, my name is Joe Kinsella. Um, I'm an entrepreneur investor from the Boston area, a serial entrepreneur who started uh, several companies along my, my time post um, uh, SUNY Oswego. I was actually a computer science major at Oswego. And uh, you know, I think one of the things I found is, is I, I had that um, desire to start companies right when I came out of school. And, um, and I think one of the things that, that I learned over the years is I, I started in the startup, the tech startup um, market, but I was always afraid to start my own company and it took me years to kind of work through the fear of failure that comes with just putting yourself out there and taking the risk. And, and, uh, but it's been, it's been incredibly rewarding. I've had an opportunity to work with some fantastic uh, people, fantastic customers, and, and it's just been, um, you know, a wonderful, um, you know, addition to my career to be able to build businesses. That's awesome. Such a great story. Andy, could you do the same thing? Just restate your name, your current position, tell us a little bit about your journey. You're muted. <laughs> I do it every time, every Zoom I'm in. <laughs> I'm Indy Lee. I am the CEO and founder of Indy Lee & Co. We're a clean skincare line. Um, my journey into entrepreneurship was a little bit different. I, much like Shania, I am, and I hope I just said your name right, um, I'm also a CPA. I had the privilege of graduating from SUNY Oswego with a degree in accounting. I went over, I worked for the big four over at Ernst & Young and then left and worked over at HBO for a number of years managing their international finance division, got to travel all over the world with them and then left to spend more time with my children. And um, I actually started another company where I was doing school gardens, very involved from the farm to table movement. And then I was diagnosed with a number of autoimmune diseases, one of them with rheumatoid arthritis um, and then diagnosed with uh, ultimately a potentially fatal brain tumor, again, autoimmune related. And then that's so when the doctor said it could have been as simple as what I was putting on my skin. And I finally took the leap. I wanted to start a company for years and really go out powerfully, but I had to be able to stand in that space and uh, said, you know what, I'm going to live and I'm going to create this line. And I'm proud to say our products are now all over the world and over 1500 doors like Nordstrom, Neiman's, Sephora, Ulta. So it's been an incredible journey. You get to do what I love every day. Such an awesome story. Thank you so much, Indy. Bill, can you do the same thing or induce yourself, your current position, your entrepreneurship journey? Sure. Uh, my name is Bill Testa from Rochester, New York. I am the CEO and CBO of Frince.com. It's a flagship company under my Direct Mail 2020 company. Uh, I've been in the printing business from the start in Oswego from 1986 is when I started my first company coming out of Oswego. And I did that for approximately 25 years to I got to a point that I wanted to do something that's never been done. So I created uh, Prince, which is a patented technology that's actually everyone's going to know about very shortly. And uh, it's a billion dollar product that we were able to get patents intellectual properties to protect ourselves and uh, bringing it out in 2022 uh, nationally. And uh, we'll get more into that as we move along. Awesome, thank you so much, Bill. Welcome. Shanae, can you do the same thing? Yes, yes. So um, my educational journey was a little bit different. <clears throat> I did my first two years at Mooresville State College um, and I got an associate's degree in accounting. Um, reason being, I had no clue I wanted to do when I first got to college. I knew I loved math, I didn't know I was gonna be in accounting because two different things. Um, after graduating my associate's degree from Mooresville, I transferred into Sweeney Oswego, so I am a transfer student, but I was in, at Oswego for four years, so I feel like I was got the whole experience. Uh, I went on to get my bachelor's degree in accounting from Sweeney Oswego, uh, stayed a year and a half extra for the plus one MBA program. Um, reason why I had that other half year is because I did take my summer off to intern. I interned at PricewaterhouseCoopers, so PwC, and actually once I left 
um, Oswego, I did start my career there off as an auditor. Um, so while I was at Oswego, I had the asp I mean, sorry, Oswego, at PwC, I had the aspirations to do something more with my skills and knowledge. At the moment, this is when entrepreneurship in minority communities kind of like started outbursting, which was 2017-ish. And a lot of people needed that business and financial acumen that those who are professionals in corporate have. Um, but yeah, a lot of these entrepreneurs do not have those same skills. They're the digital marketers and your creators, but making a million dollars a year plus and don't have any way to organize it. So hence, that's what was this inspiration to start Fuller Financial. I did start Fuller Financial at the end of 2017. At the time I was transitioning from being at PricewaterhouseCoopers to getting into a PhD program, actually. So the goal was to have the PhD stipend that I was getting help subsidize my expenses as I jumped into entrepreneurship. And I actually left the program 2020 due to it just being a time commitment. And um, with the PhD program, because you get a stipend, they expect you not to work. So it was an issue. Uh, so I was forced to leave, um, but it's okay. Because as of 2020, I've been full-time with FOLA. So this makes a full year that I've been full-time. Um, our staff has grew from three while I was in school for the first three years of my PhD program, building, building out the company, to now having 16 staff. And that's pretty much how I got here. <laughs> Awesome, such a great story. Thank you everyone for introducing yourselves. My next question goes back to Indy. Indy, what have you found to be the most energizing and exciting about your chosen career path? My gosh, it's a hard question because every, I think part of it is that, and I think every entrepreneur finds this, every day is different. And not only that, it's the community that we are building, um, specifically with Indy Lee, whether it's on social or whether it's in the stores, um, it's just meaningful. It fills my cup every day. This brand is all about self-care and this journey to more holistic living. And to know that I'm a pioneer in the clean beauty industry is something that I don't take very lightly. And knowing that I'm actually creating a change in an industry that hasn't really changed fundamentally since 1938, something I'm really proud of. So I think that's probably what energizes me, knowing that I'm creating change in an industry that desperately needed it. That's awesome. It's great to see you making change. And you're right, it is such an important industry. Bill, can you talk about the risks you've taken throughout your career and how they've impacted your entrepreneurial journey? Sure, that's a, that's a loaded question for me, but um, we'll, get, we'll get right into it. So, you know, graduating in 1987 from Oswego, I was a, you know, technology major. So I was going to be a teacher. I got outstanding student teacher. And for some reason, when I was about to graduate, I didn't want to teach. So uh, my parents were passing away at the time and, you know, being a young person at that age, trying to figure out what's next, I decided to do my passion, which was printing. So I decided to start my own printing company out of a closet and went out and sold printing all day, asking people I can, you know, can I design this menu, des redesign this logo? And then I would go back and print it at night and, and redesign it. So I did that for about 20 hours a day to the point that, um, and I tell this in all the stories that I do when I speak at Oswego, I never took taken a business course at Oswego. So accounting, all the things you need for an entrepreneur, I never did. I know how to sell. I know how to go out there and make money, but I didn't know how to control the back end. So, so what I did was I did pretty much everything wrong my first five years out of Oswego. Counting, all, you know, I didn't know what counting one. When you get calls, I need your last three years of receipts. All the things that everybody wanted from me, I, I never did. But you learn from your mistakes. So after going through all those rough times in the beginning, I learned uh, now I can go back and teach any one of these verticals from accounting to sales to marketing, you name it. And uh, learning on my own and betting on myself is what I've done my whole life. You know, you know the risk you take is the reward you get at the, at the end. And learning all along the way, one of the most powerful things an entrepreneur, a young entrepreneur going in that I didn't know is the power of the pen. When you sign contracts, when you sign lease agreements, when you sign things that you don't know what you're signing, um, that's very important to understand those things prior to being an entrepreneur. So taking those risks and doing things wrong um, in the beginning only made it better for me to where I am now. And I don't, I don't think I'd ever change because uh, it made me the person I am and I love risks. I love the challenge. 
And I used to get up at six every morning. And I thought people were working harder than me. I used to get up at five. I, I'm now at three. So I'm at three every morning and going to bed at midnight every day, just because I don't want anybody working harder than me. So the risks that I take are betting on myself and making sure that I'm the one that's doing it and making it go the right way. So hopefully that answered that question for you. I was going to jump in. I think part of being an entrepreneur is being okay to fail and leaning into it. You can't learn as well from your successes as you do from your failures. And so I think leaning into that and being able to fail, but fail fast, and then take what you're learning from it and then apply that again and again. And I think as a leader, it's important for your team also to say that it's okay to take risks and for the job as a leader and as CEO is to be there for your team. So when they do fail or they do do something wrong, you help them use it as a learning experience to move forward. And when you create that kind of environment, everything's possible. There you go. Great thought for both of you, thank you. It's very true, you have to try a bunch of stuff before you really figure it out, for sure. And you gotta do what's happy. You gotta, you gotta, do, you gotta wake up every day making sure that you enjoy what you're doing and you're happy doing it because you don't wanna get up in the morning and not wanna go to work, that's, that's not a fun thing. So enjoy whatever, you're, whatever your passion is, that's, that's what you wanna do when you wake up every morning, because then it's fun. Yes. Don't work a day. <laughs> when you love what you do, it's so true that adage. If you love what you do, you're never working. And as someone who's much like you working 20 hours a week, 20 hours a day, rather, wouldn't that be fun? 20 hours a week, 20 yeah. hours a day. It, it doesn't bother me because I love what I do. Exactly. Great comments from both of you. Thank you. Moving on to Shania, how does it, how does being an entrepreneur compare to how you perceived it in college or before you got started? This is a really good question. So when I was in college, and this is why I love Oswego, a lot of the professors in the School of Business were teaching full-time, and they were also entrepreneurs on the side. I thought that was so cool. I am a nerd. I love school. I love learning, more importantly. That's what it is. And in entrepreneurship, you never stop learning. So having that trait while you're in college, it's a great something to hold on to forever. And I always admire how the professors would teach us and then bring their work experience in the classroom. So I'm like, how cool would it be to be a professor? Hence this PhD journey, right? Uh, that was the goal, to be able to be a professor and granted, you know, get there one day still. Um, and then bring that experience into the classroom, especially because accounting is one of those subjects that is typically not more interesting to students, but imagine bringing real world scenarios into the classroom, it will be fantastic. And that's what I'm still passionate about. And luckily I get to do the educational part through my business, which again, it's um, as you know, the other panelists said, doing what you love makes it feel like you're never working. Um, so that's how I thought it would be when I was in school. Like I'll be able to balance a, a work, a work, work life balance and just and have a good time. Jumping into entrepreneurship, that is when the whirlwind starts because you really don't know what you do every single day. Even now, I still, I don't know what I'm doing. Not saying I don't know what I'm doing, but like, I just don't know what I'm doing. Every day is a new journey. It's a new problem to solve. It's a new uh, team member to probably replace or somebody to bring on board or contracts to review or it's, it's a lot. And um, I, I guess from now, I just learned how much of a person that has to have resilience to stay in this entrepreneurship game because it's always changing. So you have to be adaptive. You have to be innovative. So it pushes you and especially as you, I used to think that um, my wife for a very long time was like my family. And it was that until, you know, I got my family a house and I moved them into a better neighborhood. And then I had to refigure out what my why was because I was working so much because we think that we're not going to work a lot of entrepreneurship. You actually work three times harder. So I'm working 16 hour days, you know, six days a week. And it became the norm. And it was ironic because I left PwC for that reason. Get here, I'm doing it to myself. So I had to find what my new why was because I did start to lose motivation in the beginning. And then once I started to shift my services and um, really help business owners with growing their business, um, using their financials, so teaching them how to scale, how to project, how to get business funding, how to win grants, that became more fun because not only was I impacting full of financial and growing my team, I started to see my clients' teams grow as well. And it just started to dawn on me. I'm like, you know, I'm a very important person. You know, if one of me, these clients want to be able to 
provide for their families and their family families and their staff families. So the impact becomes greater than you. And at that point, it's like you can't go backwards, right? You can't go back because now you have basically the whole world dependent on you. That's how we see it in our heads. And it is kind of true. <laughs> so um, that's my perception of it now. Honestly, it's fun every day. I wake up like, okay, what problems are we going to solve today? Because um, as an entrepreneur, you never stop problem solving and you never stop being an innovator. <laughs> Such great insight. Thank you so much. Moving back to Joe. Joe, what is an example of a failure you've experienced and how did that inform your future decisions and actions? Yeah, that's it's an interesting one. I, I like to tell people that if um, wisdom comes from failure, I'm a very, very wise person um, because I've probably made just about every mistake you could make over my career. But, um, but I think, you know, one that always sticks out to me was uh, I started Cloud Health Tech Technologies in 2012, and it was a one-person business, and my boys were, I think, in fifth and sixth grade at the time, and, and, uh, and so I had everything on the line in this business, and I closed my first few customers, and it was a software product that I was delivering, um, software as a service product, and I closed my first few customers, and I thought I was doing well, like I thought I was, you know, building the business, and things were kind of coming along, and I had one of my customers reach out and ask me to go out to lunch and um, you know which kind of came out of the blue and we sat down and we had this very nice lunch of you know just chit chat going back and forth and at the end of it he said Joe you're disappointing me your product is not living up to the um, vision that you 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 painted to me when I originally bought and for anyone who's building a product or service as an entrepreneur like that feeling it's like a gut punch it's um, you know it's so personal personal when you hear that and um, after I kind of like, you know, heard it, took it in, I apologized and I said, well, you know, Bill, are you willing to work with me to fix it? And he just looked me in the eyes and he says, well, why the hell do you think I'm telling you this, Joe? And um, in over the next several weeks, we worked together to actually solve the problem that he wanted to solve. And, and it's actually fascinating because as we solved it, I was solving it for a much greater market. And that was the point the company went from over the next um, five and a half years, we went from less than 10 people to over 500 people in, in less than, you know, I think it was probably less than a quarter million dollars in revenue to over a hundred million dollars in revenue. And it all occurred because of a failure. And so I always look back at that and I think, you know, part of it as an entrepreneur is you really have to, you have to be willing to lean into the failure sometimes and, and, and just take it for what it's worth. Take the lesson, you know, and learn from it and realize that it's not personal. It, it, it's, it's not about some defect within you. It's about an opportunity that you're missing. And so, you know, it, it's, 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 it's to me, that's one of the most pivotal stories I always go back to when I think of failure. But I have to tell you, I have a lot of these stories to tell. <laughs> Oh, you're on mute, Carolyn. <laughs> it was going to happen at some point. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. Okay, and we actually have a question from the chat. So one of our attendees says, so much resilience and perseverance in all your stories. Do you all feel like you've always had those traits? And if not, what advice would you share with students or recent grads to be more resilient and stay focused on their goals? I think I'll jump in on that, which is I, I don't know that I always had it. I don't know that entrepreneurs are born. I think entrepreneurs are made. And so I like to tell people that in many ways, entrepreneurship is not something you choose to do. It's a calling. It's something that comes to you. And it's something that when you feel the need to do it, you can't stop yourself from doing it. Like, it, 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 you know, to many people, it seems like you're making very irrational decisions, but you can't stop your, yourself from making those decisions. And so, so I think in many ways, um, if you feel like maybe you lack the traits and you, you, you look at the hard work, um, I don't know about Bill waking up at 3 a.m. That seems, um, <laughs> that's, 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 that's dedication right there. Uh, but, but I think when you look at that amount of work, I remember working seven days a week to build my business. And you look at that, that's how, if that feels daunting, it's probably because the calling hasn't occurred for you yet. And yes. you just have to keep right. putting the work in. Exactly. And getting up at three or whatever time anybody wants to get up, it's about the passion. It's about the drive. It's the adrenaline for me. So, you know, I just, you know, I don't even know it's three o'clock because I'm, you know, it's just the, the love of what you do and the passion of what you do. That's why I said, whatever you're going to do, you have to be happy doing it and then the resilience will come but you got to get to that point so yeah i right. definitely definitely did not have any of those i was risk adverse 
And then for me, when I was faced with six months to live and young children and realized that it could have been something simple as, like I said, putting it on your skin, that I realized that was my purpose. That was my, that was my calling. I knew the rest of my life for however long that was going to be, it was going to be creating change and going out there and speaking my truth and empowering. And if that had not happened, I don't know that I would be on this panel and you would have asked me, I would say prior to that, I was absolutely risk averse. I was someone, I mean, I was an accountant. I came in, I did my job. I did the, you know, did it well, had an incredible career, but about selling everything. I mean, I started my company by selling all my jewelry, emptying my 401k, going into credit card debt, no funding, any of those things, but it didn't matter because I knew that's what I was meant to do. And I think you're agreed. It's, it's maybe some people are born with it, but I do think entrepreneurs are made and it's when you find that why. So I want to give a, um, a different perspective because it still goes along that same message that entrepreneurs are not something that you choose to do it's you you make yourself one because I've always been a risk taker since forever I've always been that kid when I was young you know playing with the boys playing football um in college I I danced I stepped we started the NABA chapter at Oswego that's still going strong amen to that um I was very always just an extra very involved very high energetic um however doesn't mean that I was ready to be an entrepreneur, right? Um, because the thing about picking up something that you're not used to doing is if you don't fully love it and you're not fully invested in it, even if you have all of those traits, you can do that thing and still fail. So it really does take that passion behind figuring out what your purpose is and figuring out what problem that you're solving. Because if you fall in love with the solution that you're providing to your clients, to your, to your customers, to your communities, you would never fall out of love with what you're doing. And now you can take that passion and match it up with that high energy, that extrovertism, and all extra good stuff. And now you're an entrepreneur. So even if you do have like certain traits that entrepreneurs may have, like I wake up early, I do this. That doesn't mean you're going to be a great entrepreneur. Once you find your calling, your why, your purpose, that's when you can go ahead and um, align purpose with opportunity. And now you can go ahead and build a hopefully a seven, eight, 10 figure business. <laughs> Thank you for all for answering that question from the chat. And thank you, Stephanie, for sending in that great question. Uh, going back to Indy, what would are the top three skills, traits, or characteristics needed to be a successful entrepreneur? Sure. Um, I think probably one of the biggest things is know what you know and know what you don't know. And what you don't know, surround yourself with people who are best in class in it. There's no possible way you can be all things to all people and know all things. We're just, we're not there yet. <laughs> and I think being able to admit that and then surround yourself with those best in class people is, is definitely something that has helped me in my business and has helped me grow from 30 to, you know, 35 plus people. Another one is for so long, this concept, and um, oftentimes it's in women, like asking for help is seen as a weakness. I absolutely think that asking for help is a superpower. Again, it goes to you can't know everything. And I really do believe that people want to give and want to be there and want to help others. And so the simple act of asking for help is giving somebody else an opportunity to step in and be there and create teamwork and synergy. So I think asking for help is absolutely one of those superpower traits that I have mastered. <laughs> um, and then um, trust your gut. Something that it took me a long time to learn and to lean into but so often we, we think too much with here, right? And we get in our own head when we know there's something innately telling us that this is the right way or this is the wrong way. And so I think that's another really important characteristic is to know what signals your body is telling you when you're on that right track. Um, but if it's the wrong one, that's okay too. Again, if you're gonna fail, fail fast, learn from it and get back up. But for me, it's knowing what you know, knowing what you don't know. It is. Um, the ability to ask for help and absolutely positively learning to trust your gut. All great traits. Thank you so much, Indy. Another question from the chat that we had was for students who found means, who found means are ways to monetize their degree, how do they manage a rate of growth relative to their studies or as a job? I don't think I understand the question. Yeah. 
is it sort of asking the question of how is it you make enough money to justify the investment you just made in college? I believe so. I believe that's what they are asking. Yes. Hmm. Mm. It's hard. I graduated so long ago. <laughs> yeah. Different pricing back then. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, honestly, I feel like honest, the way that you can figure out how to monetize your degree is really, um, cause even when entrepreneurs come to me and like, all right, I want to start a business. What do I do? I'll get a lot of those. Um, I always ask them about the skills that they already have. So in regards to monetizing your degree, that's up to you. While you're in college, you don't have to just go to class only. You know, you can be involved. You can network with professors. You can volunteer. Um, I was a part of the School of Business Advisory Board. So I was meeting with a bunch of the alumni that were entrepreneurs while I was still at school. So it's really up to you to properly monetize your degree. You can take those skills. You can take skills that you learn in school now and start a business out of it. Um, and it really is all about what you study not only in the classroom but what you learn about yourself while you're in these college years um, and then figuring out how to take those skills that education and apply it to whatever you want to do upon graduation and to add to that monetizing your degree for me I was a teacher and certified to be a teacher and that has nothing to do with what I'm doing now and almost every entrepreneur that's around me what they, what, the, what they went to school for is not even what they're doing now so going back to Indy comments of surrounding yourself with people that can help you in areas that you don't know about it still comes back to the passion the drive and what makes you happy and whatever that is whatever channel that is for what makes you happy as an entrepreneur then you take your skills from whatever degree you have and you know imply that to what you want to do and then find others and a mentor i think you should try to find a mentor that can help you go to whatever project or whatever business you want, and then you'll learn from there. Awesome, and make friends, right? Because every business has the same internal functions. There's always gonna be a marketing team. There's always gonna be an accounting department. There's always gonna be HR. There's always gonna be um, sales. And the thing about being in college is that our classmates are studying certain disciplines that we may not, right? So imagine just being pals with people, even if they don't end up working with you in the future as a colleague or a partner, it's the fact that you now have people to call on for knowledge that you are not aware of. So really it's about capitalizing your time, your network, and really making the most about your experience. I love that comment. I think networking is such an important part. And I think that's what's so phenomenal about what we're doing tonight is I would imagine most people who are stand, sitting on this, this virtual stage would absolutely answer any question offline to anybody who's asking. I mean, that's why we do. I mean, so much of my time is spent giving advice and mentoring and doing, you know, various different programs like that to help other entre entrepreneurs grow. And I couldn't agree more with Bill that so many of the people that I know who are, you know, entrepreneurs today are doing nothing related to what they went to school for, but it was that passion and drive that really brought them there. But you know what, uh, you know, as I said, so many companies have these cross-functional skills that, that are the same HR, accounting, marketing, all those things. So you lean into that, you network, you find other people. Um, and I think that's how you monetize really your education. It, it's, it doesn't have to be this one path is the only path. Right. Definitely. Um, and even as a fellow student here right now with someone who's starting their own business, selling prints and things like that, um, I feel like definitely getting involved was super huge for me and just like joining different clubs and meeting new people and especially interacting with your professors. Um, one of my professors was actually pushing for me to start my own little print business. So really getting out there while I was in college and having support from all those people was definitely super important. Going back to Bill, what should a college student be thinking and doing to prepare for the success as an entrepreneur? Great. So that actually comes off of what we just started talking about, because um, one of the things that I think is the most important, I do speak about it, is networking and networking in um, many verticals, building yourself a strong network. Coming out of college, you should be able to get heavily involved in the chamber, get heavily involved in Rotary, get heavily involved in organizations all through your community. Um, learn from the other business owners. Put yourself in uncomfortable situations as much as you can. Don't get comfortable going to the same meetings all the time. Go to different meetings, broaden your horizon, 
start building your network, start building the things that um, from accounting to lawyers to financial, you name it, you, you put yourself in uncomfortable situations by networking. It makes you more polished, it makes you better. It, it prepares you more for being an entrepreneur and also gives you the confidence on when you start going out and doing what you need to do. Um, you have your, not only you'll find maybe mentors, you'll maybe find uh, business associates. You might even find customers from your network to help you build out. And one of the other most important things that I truly feel that uh, college students should learn because I didn't learn it in college is understanding money and what money can do for you. Understanding what equity is, understanding what promissory notes are, understanding uh, how to raise money, venture capitalists, uh, stay away from them, uh, how to do uh, a number of other things. Learning about what money can do for you with your network is, is, is a powerful thing. Great insight. Thank you so much for answering that question. Shania, what is the biggest lesson learned or top advice that you would like to share with our audience? So there's, there's several lessons to learn. The number <laughs> one lesson is that you never stop learning lessons. Um, legit, <laughs> you are, you're learning lessons every day. Um, but the biggest advice that I will give is, especially in the climate where social media is big, you know, I'm a young entrepreneur, I just turned 27, um, been in full entrepreneurship for a full year and some change now. and a lot of times, a lot of entrepreneurs think that their solution to growing a business is through marketing online. You have to be on TikTok, you have to be on Instagram. I do most of my business offline. You know, social media comes secondary um, because rather than focusing on increasing marketing efforts, what I found is if you focus on solving the problem that you propose to solve even better, your clients will never leave you. And more importantly, they're gonna brag about you. The reason, the reason why um, a lot of businesses grow um, is because they have really strong referral networks. So imagine having your clients feel so accustomed to you dedicating your time, your service, and to not only solving their current problems, but figuring out what else they need and how they can grow um, from what you're providing. You're never gonna lose clients. You're always gonna have a strong, loyal network. Um, so from that standpoint, your business should flourish forever, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> and to add to that, um, one of the other things too that's important is you know, college students get out, they want to be an entrepreneur, they might try to take shortcuts, they might want to try to do things that, you know, might not be the right way to do it. Um, you know, it's very important to stay loyal, to stay trustworthy and have integrity on whatever you do, because that can backfire down the road if you're going to be uh, any type of entrepreneur moving forward, because they might remember you from your 20s, being not uh, loyal or trustworthy or have any integrity. And now you're trying to build a company that when you're married and have kids and you're 35, 40, and you're trying to do it and it's not successful, it goes back to from one of those three areas. So having those insights coming out, uh, don't take the shortcut, have the integrity and uh, the loyalty of the people around you. Great advice. Thank you, everyone. And then we have another question from the chat. What is one thing you wished you did in college that would have made a difference in your professional journey? And this this goes out to anyone who wants to answer. <clears throat> I can I jump can... in first, which is um, right, I thought it was um, you know Shania talking about being a risk taker and an extrovert. I, I, I you know I was the exact opposite, and uh, you know there weren't a lot of extroverts in the computer science department. Let's put it that way. And I think um, one of the th things you hear here is the importance of people. And, you know, everyone said it in different ways, which is, but basically everyone's telling you, surround yourself with great people, make great relationships, you know, be a high integrity person, ask for help, ask for advice, engage people in your success. And I wish I was doing that in college, which is, it's such an easy thing. It doesn't feel easy when you're in college. And it certainly wouldn't have for me, it wouldn't have felt this way for me, but it's such an easy thing to reach out and ask people just, you know, I want to do an informational interview. I want to better understand your career and how you got where you're, you are in your career. And that's it's such a cheap thing to do now that probably doesn't feel so easy, but this is the best time in your life to be building those connections and relationships. Brilliant. That exact, uh, yes, as an accounting nerd, I'll, I'm willing to say it, I am still. Um, I did not have as much fun as I should have and did not to get that experience of networking and, you know, taking those risks. I, I 
I'll be honest, I played it safe. You know, I did this. I made sure I graduated with embarrassing to say my <laughs> like really top of the class. And I was the person you'd find in the library and did not make the best use of networking with people within my student body, which is something that I, I really wish. And if I could turn back time, I would do now. It's something that I tell my children who are both in college now, go enjoy part of going to school. Um, is having all those different experiences. That's part of it. It isn't just being in the classroom and being book smart is going out and really experiencing life and making friends and networking and internships and all those things. And I'll be honest, that's not something that I did, um, but it's something that I regret not doing. Don't be comfortable, be uncomfortable. Become comfortable with being uncomfortable. <laughs> there. there we go. <laughs> Thank you so much. And then I think we have one more question. And since you're all Oswego alumni, what's your favorite SUNY Oswego memory that you've made? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh, I don't know that God. I have that well, memory anymore. So long ago. <laughs> I, I have a feeling Joy and a few others are on listening. So I don't know how. Uh, I was a Sigma Gamma fraternity guy and I still heavily involved. So I'm going to say the Sigma Gamma house was probably uh, a fun time for me. Out of Swedo. I'll leave it as that. Be good, Bill. <laughs> <Be clean. laughs> um, I think absolutely for me, sunsets for sure. I mean, it doesn't get more beautiful. Um, and I met my husband there. I mean, you know, I have this incredibly beautiful family and beautiful life. And it's because of my experience at Oswego. Um, so I would say, you know, probably, oh, and also being in the, I mean, my husband was in the AAPI, don't judge anybody, but I had some really great times in the AAPI house. <laughs> um, I would say my favorite as we go experience is definitely, honestly, I had fun in the school business. I was so involved. Like I just, I was trying to, I was in counting club, beta alpha side, beta gamma sigma. I just had so much fun mixing and mingling with the people and the fact that a lot of us who were super extrovert in school of business, like we're still all cool. Like, I don't know if you guys know Tucker Schultz, um, you know, he's still my guy. Um, so it was really the, the family that I created. Even when we studied for the, the CPA exam, we studied together. It was the sense of togetherness. I feel like if you guys are you know, still students, um, even though we're in different climates, just still try to find like a community because those same people will be there to support you throughout, right? Um, these are people that you're growing with. These are the seeds you're planting. So as you guys blossom, you'll be able to enjoy what you guys, you know, produce together. So it's beautiful. Student and someone who is just starting their own business, this, it's been really great to sit and talk with all of you. Really a rewarding experience. Okay, well, I hope you make an accounting friend. Uh, thank you so much all of you for participating and a huge thank you to all of our panelists. You, your insights and perspectives were so interesting and insightful. Don't forget to check out next week's exciting programs. We'll tackle social media, LinkedIn, and the freelance marketplace. You can check out the chat and the link for more details. Thank you all for attending and have a great night. Have a great night, everyone. Thank night, you. Night, everybody. Thank you, Thank you, everyone. Thank you again.